this afternoon, we will have the pleasure of um, learning from the experiences of uh, three faculty members. Each, each presenter will share some ideas for about 15 minutes, some highlights of their research. And then we should have a fair amount of time for some discussion afterwards. So I think I'll, I'll be mainly speaking from uh, the Indigenous academic community and some of their interesting issues and what's happening in that area in relationship to Indigenous research and the community. I'd like to kind of start with this uh, Magolta's uh, shine and shadow sort of thing. It's been interesting when I've been traveling around. And the idea uh, we capitalists, neoliberalism kind of develops a space through coloniality while these spaces are kind of in the shadow. Until most recently, we haven't been really uh, perceptive of, conscious. And so it seems like the indigenous critical research is more and more exploring that space in a decolonial view, but also turning the lens back, the epistemic lens back to institutions within societies and uh, collaborative research in various methodologies. So that's kind of uh, what I'm doing today is working on a paper that takes this kind of critical lens towards the reproduction of coloniality and our complicity in that as well as my control. That's kind of the approach and I, I'm, not, I'm just going to rapidly go through the slides because I realize I've got 15 minutes. So this is what's exciting to me is that there is a, uh, researchers, one, within these institutions, but the paradigms, method, ethics, and indigenous researchers. So we're unfolding within these institutions, and I think it marks an exciting time in the last 10 years. But the idea of uh, the analysis of settler colonialism as events, like Duran and Duran talked about, historical events, but as structures and processes, so our critical analysis is expanded around these areas. A central purpose is Western-based research, and this is well known, and ethical issues can't be considered independent of the history, the relationship with coloniality. And so we're in the process of recon recognition, reconciliation, and what, what's beyond that is the kind of next step. Because recon, recon, recognition involves the new kind of policies and acts and institutions that are developed. Uh, for example, recognition for the improvement and responsibility and accountability of certain institutions resulted in this various, these various guide, guidelines. And uh, the incorporation of various indigenous kind of values that are then played out in the procedures. And most recently in Canada, it's OCAP. There's one kind of document that might guide community uh, collaborative research. But most recently, I'm just starting to do analysis on the Tri Council policy statement. I was on a subcommittee several years ago that made recommendations. I'm just finding the literature that's developed in uh, America in a similar strategy to kind of do a critical discourse analysis of it. Just a key concept is coloniality, and that's just ongoing colonialism and the forms it takes now. And so how might we be complicit in coloniality? And that's one of the main questions now in the literature. And so, and how are academic institutions complicit? So these are kind of questions that direct the research. And it's that idea again that epistemic lens is being turned into certain processes like research, collaboration, methodologies, and institutions. And so I'll take a quick look at the history, methods, relationships, and the institutional research boards. Okay, this is what I wanted to do. So an area is uh, locating yourself with indigenous research. And as we've seen with the uh, Truth and Reconciliation here last year, this writing by Reagan became quite popular, and it involves indigenous settler relationships. And I think this is kind of the basis of uh, 
what individual researchers can do. It's that idea of positionality and outside what the institutions do. So she asks, what we choose to deny in our complicity and perpetuate in a colonial system that is rooted in violence and injustice. And there's, uh, this is another source, 2010, that I recommend, and it's about alliances and revision of those indigenous and non-indigenous relationships. So that's one, one area that I find quite exciting. This is further work here by, uh, <coughs> that begins to question different spaces. And the, this dichotomous structure is a, in the past, you know, it's been developed around racialization of certain attributes associated with indigenous people and settlers. But more recently, it's seen more as a hyphen of a positive space, a working relationships, a working with that difference, instead of the same as to make indigenous people the same. So it's that hyphen that is right now a political kind of area. Just this idea, as you know, we're disappearing in the stories about us written by other people. And so this is directly from their quotes. And it's a frustrating situation. But, so it is a positive space, and it's a matter of political, practical, and identity survival. That's a space of difference, kind of direct uh, engagement with uh, indigenous people, the settler indigenous relationship. So, in some sense, from a political decolonizing view, that hyphen is non negotiable. It's there, and it distinguishes us. So it's that kind of idea of whose story is being told and whose story is being shadowed, the shadow of identity. And I just wanted to show this quickly, I'll go through it, is coloniality is a series of events from Duran Duran and its historical processes. You can see first contact to the 60s scoop. And so where is it now, this kind of thing. So as we can see, how Western Science is kind of takes part in the colonization. Here you can see the transformation to cultural areas of indigenous lands and then to nation states. And that involves uh, empirical research. And we can see, as they say, we've been classified, researched to death, and these attributes have been, have been placed upon us. More so in the past, but I think these are good historical kind of documents that make explicit, visible, as metaphors. And finally, as kind of a, a process, as we can see the residential schools are a series that work to assimilate children and divide the communities. And Western science had a big influence on this. So it's known that colonial history, and then the reserves, 600 reserves tied together, working in harmony to segregate community from political economic development because really in coloniality it's the lands that are important not so much in indigenous people and that's been a historical view okay what's kind of interesting is different types of methodologies are being kind of appropriated and we kind of defined and renewed in different ways so for example uh, indigenous Statistics, <coughs> a recent new book, if you place it within an indigenous paradigm, the results change. But what is interesting, and I'd like you to think about this, is statistical representation, that neoliberal capitalist values, right? Usually they come out on the positive, positive side of an analysis, and these people are ruled by neoliberal capitalists free market kind of views, while the other people are being marked as deficient in these values. So and we can see this in uh, recent publications about the government, how some, some groups are ruled for, through authoritative politics, you know, in some sense. For example, look at the recent decisions to make 
the chief's personal accounts public, mm -hmm. then the disciplinary matter that is enacted when they don't. And even though I haven't analyzed the new policy, you know, it's kind of goes against what I'm told, self-determination of education. And it's kind of a discipline of ideology and pedagogy through statistical views of, well, dropout rates and this kind of deficit view of indigenous people without looking at the wider structures. So I, I want to change now to some research that's done in the States. And it involves institutional review boards and guiding documents. And so for concern for research ethics emerged mainly in the 80s and 90s as professional codes of ethics and extensions of the research board's apparatus. And of course, they're useful and they advocate, you know, outrageous abuses at times. So talking and Gishard, boards undoubtedly perform an important task, but they're about uh, protecting the institutions. And according to Denze, it's a form of ethical conduct that might not be workable now in the post colonial, post modern world. So, as an example of decentering these ideas, is they don't address the social science theory and methods that were complicit in the projects of settler colonialism right? and white privilege. So, and they don't address the dehumanization of populations in the past. So there's no attempt to kind of address the causes, rather the symptoms are addressed through these documents. So really, what, what they're suggesting is we're complicit in these ways because in some view, this type of language gets stuck in the modernity's trap that limit us to alternatives. And we done, did a bit of research on, on this, so what really happens is it's just reproducing the relationships right? from a critical view. Like, there's no doubt the importance of it. But, you know, it's legitimizing colonial practice. And the research results in this, themselves are kind of co-opted sometimes by, you know, corporations, whether it's uh, statistics, stories. You know, we hear about certain stories with the World Bank and this sort of thing. But I guess it depends on... Uh, I go back to the individual researcher and that important process because the institutions themselves are just a small part of it, but they have enormous amount of power to decide what research goes forward and, and what doesn't according to Western colonial uh, protocols, values and standards. So that's my argument and there's, in, there's a new direction of course, working towards not only the political views, uh, post-coloniality, decolonization practices, but there's a move to existential kind of approaches and working with kind of indigenous protocols and epistemologies, ontologies, this sort of thing. So instead of uh, these new kind of views, in my view, as this might be an epistemology or pedagogy being placed on top of a Western ontology and there's a movement to have what indigenous ontologies as a foundation, which is epistemologies are placed on that instead of the delinking that from a critical view happens. I'm not saying it's kind of where where the research is uh, that I understand it right now. From the critical view, and that was uh, I think two nights ago I heard this voice in. Well, you need to write something up quickly for this. So I hope it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. My name is Cynthia Nichol, and I'm a Canadian born, uh, born in uh, Saskatchewan and the Prairies. 
but I really grew up in the mountains and the Kootenai territory. Um, but from there, I came to the coast, and I grew up some more in Vancouver and in Haida Gwaii, and I really see myself kind of being like a, a daughter of the ocean and the mountains together. I don't think I could go back inland. I really feel that this is, this is my home. Um, and my name, Cynthia, means goddess of the moon, and I kind of feel that it connects with the, the earth, the sky, and the land, and the ocean. So, um, but first let me begin by acknowledging that I'm a visitor on the traditional Nazi territory, the Western people, and to thank Joanne for inviting me to share a little bit about my experiences researching with indigenous communities. I realize that with this invitation, that I've been working for about 10 years now, um, thinking about um, as a non-Indigenous scholar, working with and in Aboriginal communities. And I feel like I probably should have some expertise, but I feel like I'm still learning so much and I still have much more to learn along the way. So I wanted to share with you some stories. Um, and I thought of three principles that I was working on online yesterday, <laughs> for today, that I think are important and guide my work. And the three are um, emergent listening, uh, learning about place, and creating and sustaining relationships. So I'm going to talk about each of those three things. So, and each of those I have a small story to go with them. So a few years ago, uh, my Haida auntie, Auntie Emily, was weaving flowers from cedar bark. And I don't know if you've seen, you probably have some. I should have asked you to bring some of them here so that people could see them, but I don't, I don't have one. But she was re uh, weaving from cedar bark uh, these flowers, and they're called the roses, that she had collected the bark from the forest. And we were sitting around the kitchen table, and the bark was in the front, uh, on the table in front of us, in nice strips. Some of it was uh, in buckets below us, waiting to be soaked to become more pliable. And Auntie Emily's hands worked quickly and swiftly, turning clockwise, rotating 90 degrees, you know, folding back. And within a few minutes, she had a perfect rose made of cedar bark. And she was, she had a really good sense of humor, as you remember. <laughs> um, so with humor, she encouraged me to try. And I remember the sun coming in on the kitchen table from the west, and I was warming my hands and heating the table around which we sat. And it made the cedar feel alive in my hands. But try as I might, I was unable to mimic Auntie Emily's movements to turn the life of cedar as a workable fiber into something of a rose that was woven of cedar with petals. If uh, Auntie were a YouTube video, I could stalk her <laughs> and start her again. I could try to analyze her steps. I could pause her, I could rewind as needed. But instead, her teaching was not an articulation of steps like do this, and then do this, and then do this. It was more kind of a silent just watch and do. She laughed as I struggled to keep up with her fingers. And then finally, my Haida mom, watching us and feeling, I guess, that I needed a little bit of guidance, said, Cynthia, just listen. <laughs> what? <laughs> listening. So I thought, listening, listening. Listening is one of the guiding principles that I try to follow as a non-Indigenous scholar working in Indigenous communities. And it's something I'm continually trying to learn more about and more to do. But this wasn't listening with my ears. This is listening with my eyes and my heart and my mind and my body. And it's more than listening for what I wanted to hear or what I wanted to hear next, or what I wanted to ask, or what I wanted to respond to. And, but it doesn't mean putting aside my own curiosities and my own questions. It's more about um, instead being open to learning from others. So the people that we work with are students or teachers, community members and elders. It means not necessarily placing my own interests um, at the center, but gently moving them to the side so that the voices of others can be at the periphery and at the center, so that kind of living, breathing, kind of moving back and forth. So listening in this way is a more emergent way of being, of being open and aware of our own needs and interests, um, and it embraces a kind of humility, I think, that builds on care, respect, and trust. Um, listening to ourselves is also really important. And I think it involves listening to the language that we use when we're talking about our work, how we position ourselves, and Cash talked a little bit about positionality, how we um, talk about our work in relationship to others, and how we position others in that language. So we need to pay attention to that language and the tone of our discourse. 
um, when we're invited to research with others. So practicing research as listening is not easy to do uh, within a culture of academic research. And it's equally challenging, uh, I'm finding, and I hope we have time to talk about it afterwards, is how to invite our graduate students to do that with us. How to help our graduate students, and, my, um, and maybe just talking to me specifically, is try to help them learn this kind of emergent listening. And I think this kind of listening extends uh, beyond kinship and blood relatives, uh, to also include animals, plants, rivers, mountains, oceans, earth, space. And I think this leads me to my next principle, which is learning about place. My uh, Haida mom wove for me this cedar hat um, in preparation. She gave to me as a gift for a potlatch. It still needs the band on the inside, so it sits a little taller on my head. Um, and she gave it to me, as she gave it to me, I remember you know, placing my hand around the, the endless rows, the tightly woven rows of cedar. And it's a, both a very uh, mathematical and artistic piece of how to take this kind of three-dimensional, or linear two dimensions and make a three-dimensional form for it. At the time, um, I felt that uh, the hat, well, I still do, that the hat is a real uh, piece of complex work. Um, and it involves thinking more about harvesting the natural fibers, uh, such as cedar bark or spruce roots. And it involves knowing the land in ways in which you would need to think more about how you can harvest this in, sustain in sustainable ways, of where to go to get these materials, uh, how to be able to take them so that I can come back again. And in, um, when I feel this hat, I can feel the place of Haida Gwaii kind of woven tightly these rows. So my second principle for researching with and in Aboriginal communities um, is knowing more about the place where I am. So learning from the land and trying to think more about what is, what, whose land is this, uh, developing a relationship with the land, getting to know the historical places, the histories of the land, the memories that are in the oceans and the rivers and the mountains of the people that are before me. And with that, I think I might have a better understanding of what it means to live here. So thinking about research as also learning more about the places where we are, I think is important. And I think it's through that relationship with the land that we begin to build stronger relationships with each other and also with ourselves. And that brings me to the third principle, uh, creating and sustaining relationships. So last year, I co-hosted with Joanne the Aboriginal Mass Symposium, we're uh, having our fifth one on the end of February, if you're interested in attending. Um, our theme was mathematics, weaving, storytelling, and drawing. And my friend and principal of Aboriginal education suggested that I contact a well-known elder, a storyteller who is now living in Vancouver, to see if he might be interested in attending and sharing some of his stories at our symposium. And she gave me his phone number. So about a month before the symposium, I gave him a call. And I caught him on his way out. He answered the phone line. And I caught him on his way out, or he's just waiting for his ride to take him to the airport. He wondered who I was. He wondered how I got his number. And he was, seemed really annoyed that I was inviting him. So two weeks later, after he came back, he left a message that he was not able to attend. I was disappointed, but I wasn't surprised. Uh, feeling the pressure of time to secure his possible um, participation in the symposium, I really didn't think much about, or think more carefully about, how to create a relationship with him before I invited him. A phone call from someone not yet known to him um, or to others may have been appropriate for contacting others, but it wasn't for him. So taking him out for coffee, offering a chance for him to get, or for both of us to get to know each other, um, would, I think, now, uh, been a better place to start. So this, I think, has to do with time. So creating and sustaining relationships takes time. It takes time to build trust and respect. And we need to give our research that needed time. How we create those environments that are welcoming, where there are opportunities to build trust are crucial. But they don't always form as expected. I have a doctoral student, Jeff Baker, um, who is a Métis scholar, and he returned to his homeland in Saskatchewan to to complete his research, and is exploring the possibilities of Indigenous science education. 
He and his family are well known in the community. And he met with the district uh, coordinator to talk about possible plans for his research. He had a vision of working collaboratively with this district coordinator and co-researching together to support teachers in designing and implementing Indigenous science education curriculum. Um, and that was the goal of the district. So he had this all figured out, an ethics approval, <laughs> before he actually went. Um, and he had, had had conversations with this person. But once he actually got there, he met with them. But instead of agreeing, the coordinator gave an uncompromising no. He told Jeff that he had no interest in being a co-researcher with him. So sometimes it takes more than known connections to overcome past experiences that may have lacked relational response, responsive and heartfelt uh, connections. I don't know why this coordinator decided not to participate with him, but it could be because of past experiences that he had. So sustaining these kinds of relationships, I think, is strengthened through engagement and reciprocity. So giving back to the community and maintaining that, those kinds of connections through knowledge mobilization activities like workshops, um, looking at community performances, newsletters, conversations, all kind of maintain that uh, connection. And through that genuine reciprocity, that can help sustain those relationships. So uh, my three principles of emergent listening, um, learning about place, and creating and sustaining relationships I think are complex, and I'm really trying to struggle with how I might help and work with my grad students to learn those skills in this short period of time that they have when they're here, hopefully only four years, four to five years, so we can move them on and out into their own um, worlds to do, their, to do their own work. So I was hoping to share a few research stories and some of my reflections with you in order to highlight um, some of the benefits and opportunities and issues uh, that I faced in my research, or as my friend Raven would say, uh, a few research stories about surviving and surviving, survive, uh, sorry, a few research stories about surviving and sometimes thriving during the PhD process in order to meaningfully mobilize knowledge with our communities. So I think if we're going to talk about our research challenges, then it's also incredibly important to talk about the possibilities that can occur when we enact various strategies uh, that can transform these institutional spaces to better reflect the needs of the learners that are here. So that's why I've chosen to work with this image here from Clint Work, who's from the Pukwakiwak Nation. And um, <clears throat> in my dissertation, I worked with the metaphor of the map of box as one of the indigenous methodologies uh, that I wanted to try and um, add the box of higher education. And I'll share a little bit more about that in the next couple slides. But I really feel that this little uh, figure in the picture mm -hmm. absolutely characterizes the agency, the strength, and the transforma transformation that are needed in order to amend the box of the university. And I also really like how you see a lot of different tools, because I think those tools also talk about the various strategies uh, that we need, and that there's not just one strategy uh, that we need to transform our educational and research spaces. So I know that Joanne's already introduced me a little bit, but here's a few more photos of the lands and the territory that I come from. Uh, the, pictures, the picture here on the right is of the lava beds in the Nass Valley. I also grew up, uh, I had the great privilege of also growing up in Gitsan territory, so you pay, see a picture here of Roy Henry Vickers' uh, photo, The Meeting of the Chiefs, which is a prominent um, mountain in its that territory, close to Kyoto. And then uh, a picture of me at my graduation uh, with my new button blanket that was gifted to me by Emily and Kean Tate, who are also from my clan and also my language teachers. And then my two children, uh, Willow and Max. And I just have to say that I think Willow is probably one of the few people who made that PhD convocation hat look cute. Um, and I know she's my daughter, but I honestly think that she's probably one of the few that can do it and pull it off. So as I shared a little bit earlier, I'm hoping to share a few stories with you today um, about some of my experiences of navigating the doctoral program uh, and some of the structures and colonialism that I encountered and attempted to challenge in my research. And I'm going to end with my reflections on some of the positive changes that I've, I have witnessed and experienced since the time that I was in the doctoral program. And I'm going to highlight some of the knowledge mobilization projects uh, that I'm working on now in, with my postdoctoral fellowship. So in order to do that, I'm going to work with Joanne's seminal story work methodology, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with, but if we do have any newcomers to the group, uh, stories are our most ancient method for transmitting knowledge in Indigenous contexts. 
And Joanne's work has taught me um, so much about the importance of sharing stories in educational and research spaces as a, way, as a way to carry on this important tradition. And so also for any newcomers, um, a lot of our stories often have implicit meanings and it's up to the learner to uh, find and create their own meanings from them. So in that way, I understand that uh, the stories I'm going to share can play with different levels of metaphor, reflexivity, and analysis of my research process, and I invite you to uh, find and create your own meaning from them. And so as I mentioned earlier, I also traveled with, I would say Raven has traveled with me in many ways, and Raven is a trickster character from where I come from, uh, and in our language we call Raven Clemson. So, my inspiration to explore the topic of high school to university transitions has often paradoxically arisen from my frustrations with the structure of higher education. I've had many moments when these tensions have made me painfully aware that I'm experiencing a process which at times is invisible, and that I feel viscerally before I can find any words to describe it. The invisibility of some of these experiences were first brought to me in a story uh, with Raven. So one fall day during the first year of my PhD studies, I found myself in my department graduate advisor's office seeking assistance to complete a SHRP application. I was expressing my feelings of discontent with the fellowship's application process and procedures because it seemed kind of backwards to me. Uh, we were required to list uh, these, a number of publications that we had, uh, and which I felt that really didn't quite uh, fit with my understandings of what it meant to be a good scholar. Um, I had only recently finished my master's degree. I actually had an overlap, so I have started my doctoral program one month before I finished my master's degree. So that really didn't leave me a lot of time to work on publications, and I also felt that it was much, much more important to go out and to begin to mobilize knowledge with communities. And for many of us who do this work, we know that it can take a lot of time, and it's not something that we can quickly uh, put onto a sure application. Um, so I was expressing my feelings of discontent with her, my graduate advisor at the time, and that was you, Shauna. And, uh, and I was so fortunate to have you as my graduate advisor uh, because, you know, I, I think I was explaining to you that I was getting really tired of having to jump into an institutional box to prove that I had merit as an Indigenous scholar. When Shauna looks at me with that bright twinkle in her eyes that she usually has and says, well, why don't you start bending the box? And I thought, oh, you know, and then I instantly saw my research design. And I realized that I really wanted to create my dissertation through the metaphor of the metal box. And so you can see that here on the slide behind me. So the first, um, <clears throat> the first seven chapters, um, so each chapter would be a side of the box, as well as the top and the bottom. And then I worked with Martin Napka's concept of cultural interface. So when we bring the box together, that would be my cultural interface and my scene. And then the findings or the stories that would be shared with me in the box uh, would be a whole house in the box. And at the end of my research process, uh, the knowledge and all the stories would be given back to Aboriginal communities uh, through a number of knowledge mobilization processes as well as the academy. And I should also point out that I saw the cedar plank uh, representing Eurocentric knowledges in, the, in that it's quite rigid and it's linear. And through the process of working with communities, uh, and sort of developing a sense of collective steam bending, I would say, uh, we're taking a square shape and we're turning it into a circle. And I thought that a Bentwood box was quite a, a good representation of where we're at in the academy. I think that, you know, we've rounded some of the corners off uh, with Indigenous knowledges, but we're not yet quite in that circle. Um, and so the Bentwood box represents a convergence of both paradox and possibilities to me. So my second story is titled, Let the University let the university fit us, not us the university. So Raven had been noticeably absent. I was nearing the end of my dissertation and wondered if and when she would, she would appear again. And as it happened, she decided to make a grand display in, I think, the tenth chapter of my dissertation, which is always a great time to run into Raven. <laughs> so <laughs> her presence first brought forth feelings of fear and anxiety about writing on the topic of higher education. And she taunted me by asking me how I could write about the structure of the university with any authority, given that I had not taken any formal classes in higher education in my PhD program. And at the time, uh, I thought I was resisting these classes because they hadn't offered any critical content or any indigenous content. But then I began to really question whether or not this resistance had served me well. So I therefore uh, found myself in a state of PhD angst. And I went back to the literature, and I think I must have read, reread 80 articles and books and textbooks just to make sure that I had a grip on my understanding of um, higher education structures. And as you can imagine, that was quite an endeavor uh, once you hit chapter 10 of your dissertation. 
<laughs> Raven also led me to initiate a discussion about higher education practice and policies with some mentors of mine, Maori scholars, Graham and Linda Smith. And it just happened to be one of those synchronistic moments that led, led to a shift in my consciousness. We have been discussing the restrictive hiring policies and standards that were being enforced by some major research intensive universities. And I asked Linda at that time, I said, do you think it's the policies or the people that are um, reinforcing these, these practices? And Linda responded that it was both. And she pointed out that policies can exist without people to create and, inter and interpret them. And the people she's referring to had all been educated to promote the education standards endorsed during their schooling. So that's the people who make decisions and policy for higher education can continually reproduce the system. And although I did understand this at a theoretical level and had written about it intensively in other sections of my dissertation, I really feel it was Linda's example that helped clarify how these university policies and practices uh, become reproduced in what I call form lines or what you might call uh, discourse uh, in, in daily practices and become normalized in the minds of students, professors, and staff alike. So I really found some resonance with the words of Australian Aboriginal scholar Lester Rigney, who talks about um, how he's still unraveling the multi-layered colonial encounter. And that really helped me to understand sort of the various experiences that I was having in the doctoral program as I began to understand sort of the racist and the, the racist and sort of ethnic character of the university's policies and practices. And I realized that my acute awareness of this process uh, had significantly impacted my higher education experience. And one of the outcomes of that was my acknowledgement uh, that often these perspectives of the institution had really limited um, my thinking. And when I really need to be thinking more expansively and creatively in order to bend the box of the institution and bend uh, sort of that box of the institution of what it was in my own mind. Uh, so to that end, I was really grateful to the participants in my study. Uh, I really found them to be the true teachers who helped me to write the dissertation. It was their inspiring comments uh, that uplifted, uplifted me when I was feeling anxious and their criticisms of the university that really gave me the energy to push beyond my own limits and, and believing that we could collectively pursue transformation within the university one practice at a time. And then along with that, um, these experiences also um, led me to revisit a conversation that I had with uh, some of my Aboriginal Advisory Committee that I had worked with in the first year of my PhD studies. I'd asked the committee, uh, which was comprised of many uh, Aboriginal uh, people here in the urban Aboriginal community, uh, to help me create a research design that would help Aboriginal learners transition from high school to university. So at the time, uh, Elder Jerry Adams told me that we needed to have the university fit us, not us, the university. And I feel that his uh, statement reiterates the viewpoint of many Indigenous scholars and our supporters that are here today who call for the university to become more accountable for ensuring Aboriginal student success. And this would constitute what I would see a radical and much needed shift in university policies and practices that would enable Indigenous students to collectively bend the box of higher education for the purposes of self-determination. So I'm going to end with one uh, story of transformation. Um, I think it's been really interesting just to go back and uh, reflect on some of these stories that I wrote during my dissertation, but also to think about you know, where I am now in terms of the knowledge mobilization process. And so I thank you, Joanne, for bringing me into that uh, reflective process. Uh, so I was talking with a friend of mine, Dr. Jeannie Kerr, who some of you may know, and I said, Jeannie, I said, I don't know like, how to talk about my successes. You know, it's not kind of those things I like walking around thinking about in my head. Um, so do you know any kind of successes that I experienced uh, during the PhD? And she said, well, Amy, you didn't kill anybody. She said, that's a major success. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't kill anybody, so that, that's a, a good starting point, I guess. Um, but I think it was also uh, a nice little reminder uh, for me to reframe my words and to maybe look at some of the more transformational moments that I experienced during um, my doctoral journey as well as in my work with community, and I think in that regard I've had many transformational moments. And I'll just end uh, with a quick story that happened over this last weekend. I was, I had the great privilege of being invited to uh, share a work workshop at a youth conference over this last weekend, and um, it certainly reminded me of where my heart is and has inspired me to kind of recognize like this is why I did all this research and this is why I went through a lot of this is because this is the fun part now. This is the part where I get to go out and start meeting people again and talking about some of the stories that I learned from other Aboriginal youth and how that would be helpful. So I got to this conference and I found out that uh, 60 out of the 100 youth that were there wanted to attend this workshop and so we didn't quite have enough space for all of them. Uh, so after the co conference organizers kind of narrowed down the numbers, which I was really upset about, but they narrowed down the numbers, 
um, I also had another little surprise from Raven. Uh, I found out that um, this actual workshop was open to all students, and I had very specifically designed this workshop for Indigenous youth. And so as all of our students began walking in, uh, I, I realized that the majority of the students who were coming to the workshop were of Asian ancestry, and that we had one Indigenous uh, student in the group. So I went and I approached the Indigenous coordinator and I said, you know, I think we might have had miscommunication here. Uh, I thought this workshop was for Indigenous youth, and she said, well, we, we thought we were going to have more youth here, but unfortunately we only have five at the conference, and you have one, one here. I said, okay, well, we can make this work. And then I think she walked out in the hallway, did a, had, had a moment to think, and then she came back with two more Indigenous youth. And she introduced them to me, and I was very excited to see them. And then they, they said, listen, we're coming, but don't call us out, okay? Don't ask us any questions. And they sat down, and their body language kind of said it all. They kind of sat down, they had two Starbucks lattes in their hands, and they were going, we're going we're to drink our coffee, we're going to be completely bored, but we're going to sit here, and we're just going to make uh, the Indigenous coordinator happy. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so glad this is in the research process, because this could look like coercion, and I really don't want this to happen. Uh, but we went ahead with it, because I had, there was, there was many, many youth in the room that wanted to learn all about their visioning process for university. And so the workshop was going fairly well. Uh, by halfway through, uh, two of the three Indigenous youth seemed to be engaging with content, but I could still see that there was one young man that was sitting there, and he still had the arms like this going, uh-huh. And so we got to an exercise, which was um, a visioning model, and a visioning model for the, the university transition. And I asked them to start thinking about uh, some questions that I'd written down, and you know, uh, you know, what, what's your ultimate dream? Uh, what are some of your interests? And the kind of steps that they could take in order to get there. And so he actually he called me over, and he said, "Well, what if I don't even know what institution I want to go to?" And he was pretty perturbed by, the, by his question. I could tell he was a little bit upset, and I said, "Well, this is an amazing opportunity." And he goes, "It is." I said, yes, my sister went through the same thing. I have a sister who's 10 years younger, and she didn't know what she wanted to do for college or university, so it was a great opportunity for her. Uh, we just called up our institution, and we just wanted to see which one was the best fit. And so he said, oh, I didn't know I could do that. And I said, yes. And so I said, yeah, this is great. You can just go through every institution and go talk with people. And so from that point forward, I noticed a really quite a visible change in his demeanor and in his engagement. And in the end, um, he was the only youth in that group that finished his his visioning plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it, for me, it's those types of transformational moments um, that make the research process uh, so worth it. And I'm so excited to think about more ways to uh, share and work with uh, the youth. And so I've developed some community reports and uh, I'm looking forward to doing some comic books uh, in the future because that was one of the recommendations from the youth in my research. And then hopefully at some point, uh, when I can find somebody who's good with technology, they can help me design a website so I can put all this information out there. So thank you for listening.